Welcome everyone. Uh, sorry for the delay, but we've got to get the technicalities going here. Uh, it, it's just so wonderful to be back doing adult Christian education on Sunday mornings here, and we, it will also be on Zoom. Uh, I'd like to open with prayer. Lord God, we just thank you for this day when we can come together, we can worship you, we can sing your praises. We pray that the Holy Spirit will give us listening ears this morning and open and expand our minds as we delve into Christian social ethics. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I want to introduce our speaker. You've heard a bit about her this morning, uh, Dr. Gerhardt. She, she likes to be called Beth. So we're going to call her Beth. Uh, she has one daughter who has just graduated from Roberts Wesleyan, and she has five wonderful sisters, she told me. Uh, <clears throat> when she's not lecturing and teaching, she enjoys uh, reading, photography, and painting. Her rich background in theology, church history, and social ethics makes her a sought after speaker and a lecturer. So we are just privileged to have you here, Beth. Welcome to Webster Presbyterian Church. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to, I'm gonna keep my eye on the time because I tend to always go over, not under for some reason. Uh, but I'd like to keep my talk to maybe about 40, maybe push it to 45, we'll see what happens. Uh, but leave time for questions or just comments, discussion. Um, I'm thrilled to be asked to speak on the church wants to listen to <laughs> Christian social ethics for I think it's so uh, relevant for today and for what's going on in the world um, and applying theology and biblical understanding and interpretation uh, to that work. Um, so I, I'm going to just do a very uh, brief introduction of what kind of led me uh, to this interest I have and passion for uh, social ethics, and then give more of a theological basis for what I mean by Christian social ethics, and then talk about the predominant theologians um, and how they applied ethics, their theology, to social ethics, to the concerns of their day. Um, I have kind of, I uh, grew up Catholic, but I have a, uh, studied Luther's um, and Luther's theology of the cross. Actually, that's what my, I was kind of steeped in uh, quite a bit. And so I also come from a Lutheran uh, theological perspective. And so I'm going to bring up Luther a little bit. I know this is a Presbyterian church. <laughs> We're supposed to. Um, but it's all, I'll, uh, I'll, it's all good. It's all good. Um, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you may be familiar with him, some maybe not. Um, I gravitate um, and I teach on uh, Bonhoeffer because I think he is a wonderful 20th century um, example and teacher of that application, that bridge between theology and uh, action and resistance and care for the neighbor, that in a particular time frame that he was living, of course, um, in Nazi Germany. Um, and also uh, throw in a little bit of Martin Luther King and uh, maybe Reinhold Niebuhr and so forth. So I, I wanna uh, talk about how they understood their obligation and in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the ethics of responsibility for how Christians should act, be in the world, address uh, social concerns in particular, uh, and then talk about a few, I think, relevant themes that are important for today um, that I, you know, always say to my student, the churches need to give space for theological reflection and discussion about how to address uh, some of those social concerns today. Um, unfortunately, many times, you know, we can be reactive as a people, right? Even as Americans, like everyone's got an opinion. Um, everyone's going to jump up and say, this is what 
this is the truth with a capital T kind of thing, right? And assert it. Whereas Christians, we should be more reflective and uh, community based in our reflections about, well, what is the will of God? How um, are we led to respond and act in this world, right? Um, so that's, that is uh, where I am coming from um, today and where I'm going. Uh, so I, I actually have had a few careers. I was an elementary school teacher in my 20s. And then from there, because I was working in inner city school in Rhode Island, I kind of got led into social work because we couldn't afford a social worker. And I was the one visiting homes and doing all that. So they said, oh, could you be the school social worker? Of course, I had no background in it. Uh, so that led me into getting my MSW and getting involved with that. And it's kind of a long story, but I ended up working with victims of vi domestic violence and running um, in Massachusetts about a woman's shelter and uh, so forth, getting involved. But I never lost my love for theology. I had gotten a master's just for the, actually, I always say it's my favorite degree because I did it for myself. I did it for the fun of studying. It was a summer program at Providence College and I just love theology, but I was in the world of social work and in really studying um, violence against women, but also global violence um, against women and girls and making those connections. But it led me to want to, from some experiences with pastors, realizing even though many pastors had maybe a master's of divinity and they were out there in churches, they didn't have any background in domestic violence or what are we to do? So I ended up training pastors and developing a program for them in Massachusetts. But that led me to think about, wow, why there seems to be a disconnect sometimes between our theologies and actually caring for our neighbor, how we're sp supposed to respond or should respond maybe to some social questions. So that led me into, um, a doctoral program at Boston University where I could really marry both of those loves of theology, historical theology, and social ethics. Um, and as a result of that, another long story, coming back to Rochester, because this is where I was raised, and I was a single mom of a daughter. I wanted her to grow up with her wonderful aunts and cousins and all that um, to teach uh, at the seminary at Northeastern Seminary. And even when I went there, now this is 20 years ago, there were no courses uh, on social ethics. Uh, there were no courses on social justice or on um, violence against women, gender reconciliation, not, nothing. So we developed, now we have a, a strong um, program, master's program on that. Um, so that's led me to my passion around, um, for me, in other words, theology wasn't just an abstract study. You know, oh, this is kind of fun to read. Like, you know, let's read Thomas Aquinas's thing. But if there wasn't an application, if I couldn't make the connection to the reality of today and our world today, I think God has us here in this time and place season, um, then I, it didn't really interest me. I was really interesting in, interested in those connections and did not see our spirituality and our being as disciples of Jesus separate from those larger questions, right? I know there is a type of theology that focuses on, well, it's just about, I'm getting saved, going to heaven. I got to kind of put up with and <laughs> detach myself from this world is going to hell in a handbasket. Can I say that word in here? Sorry. Uh, in a handbasket. Um, and who cares, right? That's, that's not where I come from. Um, I... I think we are here for um, a purpose um, in this time. I also, you know, start with Christology. Uh, my theology has a high Christology that um, God sent Jesus, right? Incarnate uh, God as a baby in a poor, to poor parents in an occupied country. I mean, you can't really get much lower Actually, he wasn't even born in his home, right? So you can't get lower than that, how God chose. And God could have chosen whatever, however God wants to choose, right? Um, but that is injustice. In the words of Martin Luther, that's just not a nice Christmas story. That has meaning that tells us who God is and who we are to be then, subsequently. 
Um, and look at Jesus' death on the cross. There's no more painful or lowly death than that, right? So from the crib to the cross and teachings of Jesus and so forth tells us who, who God is um, and gives us clues then about how we are to be and how we are to act um, and what does this really mean when we say we are a Christian? What does that really mean, right? Is it, you know, a group of doctrines that we say yes, yes, yes to, but yet don't act on? Or really, I think if we did, it's a kind of radical way of living and countercultural way of living to truly follow uh, the way of Christ. So that's what I mean by my foundation then more is a Christological and theological uh, one. Um, so I, I think of it sometimes because I'm visual as a house. Um, last summer, in the middle of the pandemic, I had noticed some water for a couple of years, to be honest, that I ignored around my basement. And I generally have a dry basement. But I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's not bothering me too much, right? Except one day when there was a deluge and I walked down, and I hit a little pond and I'm like, oh my gosh. And um, calling uh, to get that. And of course, that was a whole other, that's a whole other story. Those of you who know about basements and how to fix basements, I had no clue. I, you know, spending money on a basement or a roof is not really fun for me. Like, you know. um, so at the same time that was happening, Another rainstorm, I noticed I was up in my daughter's room on the second floor, and I, because she had moved out, so I wasn't up there that often. I'm like, what's that little spot on the roof? I touched it, and it was damp, and I'm like, that's, that's not good. That's not good. So, so, you know, having to deal in one summer with a roof and the basement, of course, my mind always goes to how can I apply this? <laughs> you know, that those are the things that sometimes we ignore, especially as privileged, I'll speak for myself, a privileged American that's not dealing with hunger or suffering, you know, day to day, it's easy for me to go along with my life quite comfortably and maybe compartmentalize suffering in the world because it's not part of my roof or my foundation. I'm not shaken, right, uh, by those issues. But when there is a problem, when there is a crisis, then we need to, then we attend to it. Um, and I think of social ethics that way sometimes as uh, we as Americans to just go on our comfortable life and um, not be paying attention uh, to the suffering or the brokenness uh, going on in the world. I'll just tell a real quick, this is kind of a shallow story, but apply. So uh, in the church that I had been in, I'm not presently there, but this is going back a few years, uh, we were talking in adult, actually it was an adult education about how we responding. It was a, a talk on global issues and economy. And someone started talking about, well, you know, feeling kind of proud, like, oh, well, we have a fair trade uh, booth up in our Narathex. We talk about buy fair trade, you know, things that we do. And I said, so I'm assuming we're during our coffee hour, we're drinking fair, I, I made that assumption, we're drinking fair trade coffee. And there was silence in the room, the people who had been there longer than me, and they said, well, no, we don't drink it on Sunday morning. <laughs> and I said, why not? And they said, well, it's a little more expensive. Like we, you put your quarters in the cup or the down, you know, for a cup of coffee. Well, we'd have to ask people to put some more money in. I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so in an abstract way, great idea. Let's talk up fair trade coffee where workers are getting paid for what they should being treated right. But, ooh, am I going to pay an extra 50 cents for a cup of coffee? You know, then it comes home uh, to roost. And it brought up an inter interesting discussion with many folks saying, wow, I'm I never really thought about, you know, it's just that separation, what's abstract and then what's real. That's a very tiny um, example of, of that. So, you know, Jesus gave a mission statement or gave us the beginning of their foundation and framework in Luke 4, verse 18 and 19. I'll read it. Uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, 
and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's quite a mission statement, right? Um, so that is Jesus simply saying, this is why I'm here. This is how, why I came. So how he came and then his message and his uh, mission statement really should shape then how we think about what are we to do or respond, right? Um, I had, there was one uh, church that was very, you know, talked about how proud they were of all their programs and um, everything going on, but they realized in a time of crisis, like we have all this, but when's the last time we really talked about why do we do what we do? Why do we continue? Because it's tradition. So we do this program every, right? And stepping back and kind of suspended their program so they could have time as a church to talk about their mission. Let's, let's, you know, we're in a different time than we were 20 years ago when these programs started. How are we today to respond um, to God's guidance uh, for our work? So that needs to resonate not just with our opinions or what we think would be a good plan, but what is God's will in how we are to act. So as a form, for example, for as a former social worker, the question was, we, you know, we look at a, a problem or concern and then think about strategies to respond to that and to act, right? Um, so that's kind of a sociological perspective or way of addressing but as Christians, I think of it as, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that Christ is our point of departure. You know, that we start in a different, a different way. We might end up doing some of the same activities and so forth, but it's Christ who is our point of departure. So Luther, um, giving just a little bit of a historical theological uh, point here. Luther stressed the role of grace and justification by way of faith as a foundation for works or ethics. He didn't use the language of social ethics at that time. Because we're called by grace, uh, discipleship, and discipleship then subsequently our works and our service for the other is a result of our life given by grace. So in other words, righteousness then, and Luther learned this the hard way in his life, is a promise of God, not a demand, right? Initially, Luther thought, oh, it has to be my righteousness. And he literally was beating himself up as a monk, right? He had to be perfect and, and just do what a penance all the time. Matter of fact, his confessor, because he went to confession so many times, his confessor said to him one day, would you stop coming to confession? <laughs> like go out and sin and then come back or do some, right? Uh, you know, a little overboard here. And he said it, and he was a, a biblical uh, scholar, but he said in another reading one day of Romans, and I think of that as the Holy Spirit, um, he said all of a sudden it, it just, it was the spirit. I, I saw clearly that God wasn't talking, it wasn't talking about my righteousness, but God's righteousness, right? And then he said, that made all the difference. Uh, so it was about God's promise to us. His God is always what he said for us. And in being for us, that gives us a clue how we are to be what? For our neighbor and to others, for others. Um, so that is an energy or um, I know uh, language in our American um, modern times, when you hear the words pro-life, you think of an, it, most people will think of an issue, right? The issue of abortion. Well, pro-life really was, is a call to be for our neighbors, for all of life, right? Luther used that term, for pro novus, which is Latin for uh, for us, that God is for us, um, and so therefore we need to be for, for others. Uh, so our works then and our service is a faithful response to God's love given freely. Luther writes of our bondage to God, so he is known as a dialectic theologian, that we are so, we are bound to God. So because we're bound to God, right, in that mission that I just read of Jesus, we're bound to that, that 
that leads us to be free, but freedom, and we'll talk about this later, because that word is thrown around in Christian circles so much today, religious freedom, and I always, that just gets me going, because I push back and go, wait a minute, religious free freedom is not, I can do whatever I want, think, well, oh, you're in, you know, you're infringing on my rights. That's not Christian freedom. Christian freedom means freedom to serve others. Why? Because we're in bondage to Christ. So Luther uses that beautiful dialectic of we are always bound to Christ. If we are followers, if we say we're followers of, of Christ, um, and in that bondage, then we're set free to serve others, right? But that is coming from how God directs us to serve others. It is not rooted in American individual rights to do. I can do what I want, right? So, but we have the attention. It's not to say individual rights are not important. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but that's coming from a different place. That's not coming from um, a Christian perspective or Christ is our point of departure. So the other um, dialectic or thing to keep in mind, I think when we're talking about social ethics is this dialectic of uh, gospel, the ultimate, what's called the ultimate theologically and the penultimate. The ultimate has to do with anything of, of God, the divine, right? Penultimate has to do with this earth. So when we talk about education, it's penultimate. Politics is penultimate. Um, so, you know, Luther does a nice, I think a nice work and connecting that as a dialectic, again, is the ultimate God of gospel. He'll say the gospel is free. And if it's ever coerced, mandated, then it's no longer free and it's not the gospel. Um, and there's a dialectic with that and what is earthly or penultimate, what is the law um, and how uh, Christians should respond by way of law. So they're not separated, but they are distinct, and that's important. So one day I was at a 4th of July party, this is a few years ago, and I heard someone um, I know, uh, well, who's a Christian, said something about she had been to church that morning, and um, the flag, I don't know, she said, oh, I saw a flag, and it was upside down, like the flag is so sacred. I didn't say anything. I bite my tongue a lot at parties and places I go. I didn't say anything. But what I was thinking was, mm, no, the flag is important. It's symbolic, right? Um, but it's penultimate. It's not sacred. Um, that, and I think there's a confusion sometimes of our loyalty, um, a loyalty and obedience, right? Yes, we're called to be loyal, but we have to recognize there's boundaries around, let's say, political or national loyalties and so forth. Um, and that's where discernment and community discernment comes into play. But our obedience is only given to God, right? I worked with battered women, I continue to for a number of years. And I always said Christian abused women were my toughest audience toughest audience and tough it I did clinical counseling I had a practice for a, a number of years um, most um, hard, most difficult in a way uh, to counsel because I had to get through layers of false biblical teaching right uh, so one woman who said well my husband knows the scripture and she had been abused for a number of years he he, he knows the scripture so much better than I do and you know, he tells me that's what's in, I have to be obedient to him. And I said, that's a false, that's a false idol. He's wrong. And I said, I think maybe Satan knows scripture. And, but, you know, no, your obedience is to God. God doesn't want you to be a doormat. God has called you to be free, right? Um, free in the deepest, fullest uh, way. But it took a long time for her to understand that, that, that even the use of the Bible can be a tool for bondage, a false bond, right? A bondage is not rooted in obedience uh, to God. Uh, so let me, I'd like to read a little quote. I, I wrote a book just to give a little, little marketing uh, piece to that, the cross and gender side um, a few years ago. And it is 
focusing on violence against women in, from a global perspective um, and that the numbers really rise to a type of gender side. But a lot of the book too presents, uh, like there's a chapter on Luther, chapter on Bonhoeffer, a, a theological perspective foundation for doing the work of ending violence against women and girls. And then some clues at the end of the book on you know, what the church uh, can do. Uh, so th this is a quote from, from my book. Uh, so questions regarding the good and what must be done are not relevant as starting points for Christian ethics. Bonhoeffer, deeply rooted in Luther's theology of the cross, argued that it's the character of God found in the revelation of Christ that shapes the most relevant ethical question, what is the will of God? This radical center of Christian ethics reveals the assumption about ultimate reality. And this is a quote from Bonhoeffer. When the ethical problem presents itself essentially as a question of my own being good and doing good, the decision has already made that the self and the world are the ultimate realities. All ethical reflection then has the goal that I be good and that the world by my action becomes good. If it turns out, however, that these realities, myself and the world are themselves embedded in a holy other ultimate reality, namely the reality of God, the creator, reconciler and redeemer, then the ethical problem takes on a whole new aspect of ultimate importance then is not that I become good or that the condition of the world be improved by my efforts, but that the reality of God shows itself everywhere to be the ultimate reality. So this description of the meaning and center of Christian ethics shapes Bonhoeffer's understanding of how the church must respond in his time, it was to the atrocities resulting from the Nazi regime. Theological and ethical reflection begins then where? In prayer, in discernment, discerning the will of God, and who um, is the world's ultimate reality. So it's, it's, you can see kind of the difference then in thinking or shifting um, I think it's important as Christians that we do into thinking about, it's not just about, I mean, that's it, important, right? To do good things, to be moral and stuff. That is not the center of Christian ethics. It's Christology. It's the will of God. It's uh, Jesus' mission. So I frame, uh, when I teach Christian social ethics, I frame it in terms that going back to that house, what's part of that framework is that Christ, from, from my perspective, there's other perspectives, is that framework needs to be embodied, contextual, concrete, like specific, and hopeful always. My approach then is an abstract, or it's not even overly optimistic, um, which optimism and the, kind of an optimistic approach, it still centers in the self, right? That's what it is. Um, but it's hopeful, maybe not optimistic sometimes, but it's hopeful and hope, I think, is uh, rooted in God's reality. Um, I had I last spring, and I'm teaching it this fall again, but I taught it last spring, a gender reconciliation uh, course and, and discussing uh, issues around uh, violence against women and girls and also how do we move together as uh, both men and women um, in being reconciled and countering or resisting uh, violence. And I've been doing this work and talking about it, mm, I'll show my age by saying 30, 35 years, yes. Um, and one of my students spoke up one evening and said, you know, I feel angry all the time. This is going on. And it's just, it's so overwhelming, you know, what happens to girls in the world. And we recently see what's happening going, what's may unfortunately be happening in Afghanistan regarding women, girls and women. And so she said, I'm so overwhelmed by that and so angry. Um, and how do you, how do you continue even 
to talk about it or work um, in this area. And I said to her, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not angry. I am angry. I get angry. Uh, I get frustrated. Uh, I get discouraged. I said, but what always brings me back, I have to stop, right? And have a practice of prayer. What stops me is remembering it's not my work, first of all. It's really, I believe, the will of God uh, to bring peace and reconciliation. Uh, so I feel like when I, I stop and I think about just entering into that, is God has called me to enter into it, then it's not about my success. It's about being faithful, right? It's not about success because it's not coming from us. It's about being faithful to, to the call, right, to follow through or to do. That to me, I said to her, it takes the weight off of me. You know, I... I can look at a lot of different things I do or tasks I've done. I'm like, oh, I really failed at that. I really blew that. Or I didn't, I don't think I helped. I recently, I was trying to help counsel a young woman. Um, and she was in an abusive relationship. And she disappeared after two, three times, she disappeared on me. Um, I'm like, oh, I wish I had said this. Right. So you can get overwhelmed with feelings of failure, but then I have to stop and go, you know, that's, that's not what it's about. I do believe God doesn't call me to that brings calls the church to work towards reconciliation. It's about being faithful to their call, uh, not being successful in the world's uh, eyes. That brings me hope. So um, it's an idea of what I mean by contextual or an example is looking at the context of the dilemma or the concern, social concern. So when we're talking about Christian social ethics or any social ethics, right, we're looking at not just personal moral questions, we're looking at systems and structures that may be uh, causing some social concerns, right? So and we're talking about economic uh, deprivation, let's say, um, yes, we need to care for the person, you know, the food banks, that, that would be an idea of more of a personal, right? You, you need to care for individuals. But what is important is to look at, well, what's causing the poverty? Why in this area, what, what systematically is happening? Uh, Luther talked about uh, a wagon, from the top of a hill rolling down and running, you know, just being let loose and it's running over people. Uh, he said, well, you know, you can keep caring for the victims under the wheel, or you can go to the top of the hill, right? And before it even starts, you can put a spoke in the wheel. So that spoke in the wheel is something Bonhoeffer picks up on in the 20th century um, and says, well, wait a minute, we're maybe, Churches and Christians were all about, we can care for individuals, but we kind of balk at re, what he called resistance to evil systems. And do we even identify where the evil lies and how to put the spoke in the wheel, um, how to resist? We're a little more uncomfortable with that because it pulls us out of our comfort zone, um, perhaps to even at times break the law. Um, there was, I had a really interesting discussion, this is going back again years in the classroom where I said to them, you know, there was a law going through, no one's paying attention to, and it was kind of moving, discussed in, in Congress, you know, what are we going to do about those uh, undocumented uh, folks, and, you know, we'll make it illegal to feed them, to care, to provide anything um, to, if someone's undocumented. And I, I said to Claude, it'd be interesting to see what denominations, what churches respond. And the first response was from the Archbishop, Catholic, in the Catholic Church, Archbishop um, Maloney, I think it was, in Los Angeles, who said, well, then you're going to have to arrest me. If someone shows up at my door and is hungry, I'm not going to ask them for their papers. <laughs> I'm not going to ask them if they're documented or not. So go ahead, I'll be the first one to go to jail. So I'm like, sometimes then... Uh, being Christian means being a criminal, right? I, I put on Twitter, I got some feedback from this. Uh, I think it was last year where they were talking about in Georgia, not giving food and water to people standing in line to vote. 
and I tweeted out, I try not to be too whatever, but um, I tweeted out something like, well, I guess then Christians are gonna have to be criminals, right? We have high, or again, it's that obedience to higher law um, and being able to discern what is just and unjust and what violates uh, our disciple, right? Our relationship with, with God. Um, so we had an interesting conversation in the classroom because one of my students said, well, one way to determine if something's ethical is, is it legal or not? And I said, oh, well, how about in a time of slavery? That was legal in our country. Does that mean you should have, you know, work to overcome over in civil rights? So we brought up and he was like, oh, I never thought of that, right? Uh, so that, again, that separateness between the, what is ultimate of God and what is uh, penultimate is an important uh, question. And also the larger uh, context. So Bonhoeffer asked this question. He said to the church of his time, who is Jesus Christ today? Who is Jesus Christ today in the time that we're living? How does the church understand who Jesus is? Not that Jesus is unchanging, but the perception and the following of Jesus the church can change given the political or the cultural, the context of their day. And so that's a Christological question. And he said, what follows that question then is what is the mission then of the church today? And how are we to act today and be for the neighbor? How do we interpret that being for the neighbor, right? But he said, it starts with that first question because the rest then will follow. And sometimes it's complex, and that's why I think theological uh, reflection, what we're doing today and discussion on this is so important in churches because it can be complex. I remember one time, um, I was really studying where our clothes are made, right? The factories, uh, particularly in Sri Lanka or India, in China. I visited a couple of factories in China, uh, saw some of the uh, conditions there were not good. Um, and got in the habit of when I bought something, looking at the tags, where it was from, you know, that to me was kind of a responsibility of if Christians, you know, brought these questions up. And then we just had discussion in it, actually it was in that same church adult um, ad question about that someone raised, well, if that factory is closed down because no one's buying that, then those girls in the factory, they have no income at all, right? So it's not often an easy answer, uh, but I would argue, at least let's raise the questions. At least let's get in the practice of listening to people who don't agree with our opinions or our thoughts about it, uh, because I think it's really that communal community that is important of discerning, right? And maybe we've lost the practice of listening uh, quietly and with kind of a disposition of maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe there are some factors I'm not thinking about here. That disposition of humility that we don't often find in all the, oh my goodness, everything going on, right? I mean, we're bombarded with people yelling at each other. You know, we every day you turn on the news, you turn on, you know, tuned in anywhere. Uh, but Christians have something to offer. It's a different way of being and being with each other. Uh, that ability to listen and to discern God's will in response uh, to these, these questions. Uh, let me read, let me read another quote here. How So it's another just, maybe I'll skip it. Well, I won't. Um, so it's, this is from uh, uh, my former advisor talking about Luther. Luther doesn't speak of social ethics per se, but that doesn't mean in our sense of the phrase, he didn't develop it or help to develop it. He was a Luther scholar. So what Luther does speak of is service to the neighbor, service that's inseparable from service to God. Indeed, it is service to God 
It is because God serves us that we serve others. As Vatma has emphasized in his thorough study of Luther's theology of worship, worship and service to others are inseparable. There's no doubt that both worship and service are corporate and communal. The reform of worship included the renewal, this is the 16th century, um, of social life. Now, there's no greater service of God than Christian love, which helps and serves the needy. Worship creates a community, and the community serves others. The work of the people does not stop at worship, rather begins there as the work of the people for the benefit of others. It is what has been called the liturgy after the liturgy, which I like a lot. It's a continue, continuation of what here, happens here on Sunday morning. It doesn't stop right at noon today. It's a continuation, and to see it in a holistic uh, way, I think, is, is really helpful. Um, I'm just kind of aware of the time here. So going back to uh, Bonhoeffer, another way he looked at the role of the church um, in us as Christians, as we have three tasks, which for my, I like kind of, you know, simple one, two, three you know, <laughs> uh, frameworks and so forth. So he talks about three tasks. One is preaching the gospel caring for others and resisting um, evil. So I want to just uh, talk for a minute about that resistance uh, part of it. Because again, you know, it, it's, it's not three separate parts, it's all one, but it is the care for the other um, that and resisting evil when we're confronted with it, I think that is so sometimes uh, difficult. So the and I talked about Bonhoeffer's the center being you know uh, Christ, and so his understanding of how the church responds uh, to these. I think I'm looking at the wrong. Sorry, um, mixing up my things. Um, starts with Christ. and I'll, uh, This is from Balthagum, sorry, on Bonhoeffer. So Bonhoeffer introduces us in 1935 to the problem what we today call political resistance. The levels of confession and of resistance could no longer be kept neatly apart. The escalating persecution of the Jews generated an increasingly intolerable situation, especially for Bonhoeffer himself. He now realized that mere confession no matter how courageous, inescapably meant complicity with the murderers. Even though there would always be new acts of refusing to be co-opted, and even though we would preach Christ alone Sunday after Sunday, during the whole time, the Nazis never considered it necessary to prohibit such preaching. Why should it? Thus, we were approaching the borderline between confession and resistance. And if we didn't cross this border, our confession was going to be no better than cooperation with the criminals. And so it became clear where the problem lay for the confessing church. We were resisting by way of confession, but we were not confessing by way of resistance. So the confession alone, going to church, well-meaning, right? German Christians, Sunday after Sunday, going to church, and the Nazis didn't see them as uh, threatening in any way and allowed uh, the churches to operate. But that cooperate, it was really cooperation with criminals. There's a really startling photo, and if you go to the Washington Holocaust Museum uh, website, is one is. It's just incredible, the amount of education materials. And, but they also have um, photos, right, from that time. And one of them is, is very powerful. On one side of the street, you see a church in the distance. One side of the street, you see, you know, folks walking to church down the street and headed towards the church. On the other side, you see Jewish prisoners bound and Nazi soldiers going in the other direction. It's just this visual kind of startling um, thing. So that was um, 
that's another kind of piece, I think, with social ethics is you always have throughout history prophetic voices. I think Bonhoeffer was is, one, is definitely one of them. And those, I'm sorry, those, I, I don't have time to go through Bonhoeffer's background, but if you, you read it, he comes from a prominent Berlin family um, and he gets involved. He's a pastor and probably if World War II didn't happen. He, we wouldn't know the name. He was just a, a pastor. He taught university, so forth. But because of the context of his time, he didn't think he could be disembodied. When we talk about the embodied uh, Christianity, he needed to be a part of uh, the Confessing Church. It was a group of pastors that came together and said, we don't agree with the co-opting of the church, what's happening. Hitler put some of his folks on top of the church. Um, he was even saying if a pastor had a grandparent who was Jewish, then they couldn't be a pastor anymore. So um, uh, Bonhoeffer and some others in the Confessing Church talked about the problem here is boundaries between state and church, right? The state is stepping over our boundaries and so came together. And so Bethka was talking about the Confessing Church initially was all about you know, in the Barman Confession, 1934, say, these are our confessions. We're not supposed to have any false gods. Isn't Hitler a false god? Because he's, you know, so they're laying out the confession, reminding people about what? That primary Christological question, who is Jesus Christ for us today? That's what they're about. But they stopped short of resistance. And Bonhoeffer actually ended up not signing, although he had was part of the drafting, signing that confession, because he argued, you need to put something in there about the persecution of the Jews, what we are to do, how we are to resist. And the general confessing church, they weren't ready to do that yet. This is still the early 30s um, until more in the latter 30s. But Bonhoeffer was an early voice saying, no, <laughs> you are also colluding if you're not actively resisting evil. Um, so these prophetic voices, Walter Rauschenbusch in our country, actually he taught at um, Colgate here in Rochester, uh, turn into from the 1920th century with all these social questions, right, about labor and so forth. This is before um, you even have the number of hours you can work. We had child labor, um, uh, just you know, terrible and unjust economic um, systems going on. And Rauschenbusch was a theologian and a teacher who said, you know what, I hear, I go to church and I hear preachers talking about not chewing gum. Apparently that was a thing. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that was immoral to chew gum, you know. Um, he said, but I don't hear anything about the tainted milk that we're selling to mothers, pregnant mothers in South America, which is in one of his uh, things. We're not addressing the social questions. In other words, we're not doing social ethics. You might be feeding individuals or talking about personal morality, but it's sin uh, to be engaged or quiet about these other social questions. Um, we have uh, Martin Luther King, right, uh, who civil rights in the 20th century didn't start with King, but he was a prophetic voice and there was a gathering of the community, actually, when the first actions in 1955 was the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and I, I teach about that in my classroom because I think it's a beautiful example of community response. Uh, the community came together every evening during that time, came to church to worship and to hear the speakers, Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King. King was new pastor in the community and kind of they made him kind of a leader because he didn't have political attachments and he was new and young and had the energy so and then he was such a charismatic speaker but it was the community the people that came together and said yep we're not going to use the buses and mostly it was the women who are walking miles and miles every day right to go clean a white woman's house and then walking back, getting supper on the table for their family, then walking to church. And the joy when you see that the video of that, um, uh, that episode, there's just such joy and community decision to we're going to resist evil. We're not going to sit on the back of the bus. It's not just about that. It's how we're treated a second. This is going against 
our understanding as Christian brothers and sisters to how we are to live in our community, right? But that came from the community. But the frustration that a Bonhoeffer had, a King had, um, Dorothy Day is another example, a Rauschenbusch. It's interesting to read that their greatest frustration were not with the perpetrators of the evil, it was with the churches. It was their frustration of, why isn't everybody, you know, reacting and responding? Um, but that is usually the voice of a prophet, right, will irritate people um, and urge them to be uncomfortable and to move from care for neighbors, seeing it as individual, to resistance uh, to evil. Um, I make all my students read, because uh, I think it's one of the top five most important uh, pieces for studying social ethics is Letter from Birmingham Jail, written by, by Martin Luther uh, King. And it just lays out, I think, beautifully that connection between theology and what are we to do, or the ethics, God's will, and how we're to enter into God's will in a specific concrete, again, embodied, concrete, specific time. But he writes about his frustration also in that letter. And he's writing to pastors, right? He's, he's writing to well-meaning pastors who said, we're with you, we agree with what you're doing, but slow it down, you're, you're causing too much trouble, right? And that's his frustration. First, I must confess, that over the years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling, stumbling block is the stride toward freedom is the white citizen's counselor, the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice, who prefer, prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with you on your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of good will is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. So um, I told you I always speak over rather than under, sorry. Um, but let me um, just mention, I think some of these ethical, free, social ethical themes are really very relevant today. One being this theme of freedom that I already mentioned, a misunderstanding of what does it mean? What does religious uh, liberty mean? What does freedom mean? Um, how do we discern, yes, I have individual rights, but how do I, that dialectic, I, I can't forget my, that I'm called to be free to serve other people. So when when does the common good and the public good, when does that kind of trump what I want or my individual uh, freedom? I, so I think that theme of freedom is important, that discerning, which might be obvious, but I don't think it is, who is our neighbor? That question, who is our neighbor? Is our neighbor just Americans or is our neighbor uh, those south of the border waiting to get in. Are they our neighbors too? And if we say, yes, they are because they're created in the image of God, right? They're my brother and sister too. Then how do we think or talk about, or what do we do about policies? Is it like one side or the other? Is it often portrayed? Or is there a place for dialogue and listening to each other and the suffer listening to the suffering of those folks. I went down, I just felt called to um, put my body at the border a few years ago. It was right before uh, it closed. Actually, I got back right before everything shut down that March of 2020. 
And I thought, I, I need to get down there myself. I need to listen to people's stories and stop like just forming opinions, right? So I went down there, it happened to be the timing was good. There's a, a conference of people who were doing the work in El Paso, working with refugees and immigrants. Um, but I had an opportunity then to go over the border to Juarez, uh, to a shelter there. And we just, I just sat for an afternoon and listened, particularly to these moms with little kids running around and how they were stuck in the shelter and they couldn't walk down the street because of the danger to get food for their family. It was just like a prison they were in. But their stories of trying to get over the border, the immigration, they were actually seeking asylum um, and how they were put in the cages when the women was assaulted by a guard there while her husband watched and couldn't do it. So some of the, the pain and the suffering and what each one of them said at the end, which made me cry, because I'm like, oh, isn't that obvious? Said, Please go back and tell Christians that you know, we're the same as they are, that we're human beings. They kept saying that. Tell them we're human beings. Tell them we love God too. And I was like, of course, you know, but what they weren't, they weren't reassured of that, that, that that was how they were seen. So who is my neighbor? And how do we communicate that in our actions? Um, so I'm not suggesting this is not about policies, but it leads to, right, if we're being concrete about it, we can't just have our opinions or have nice discussions in our comfortable churches. We need to really discern as a community, how are we to be a disciple and act um, and maybe um, offer resistance when we need to offer resistance. And there's, and we didn't even get into it today because there's no time. Um, the whole theme of power is, is really important. Um, uh, as also a strategy understanding that Reinhold Niebuhr, 20th century the public theologian, who's probably one of the most, I think, important ones in the 20th century, wrote beautifully about this uh, concern of power, that those who have power, he said, don't, because we're human, we like power, we don't willingly just give it up. We have to be coerced into sharing power, because those in power to give it up you feel like, oh, this other group's going to have power over me, right? That's a feeling. But to work towards whenever there's one group in power over the other, to work towards equality and justice, it's difficult for people in power to give that up. And that's why we see sometimes violence and struggle every time a group is trying uh, to get justice and equality um, and a social justice then we see sometimes a backlash of violence. And so the work is, you know, to talk about that. What does it mean to share power? What does that mean to come together in community? And Christians should be the first ones, right? And King said, we need to be the headlight, not the taillight when it comes to some of these um, concerns. Um, but I think understanding those dynamics is uh, very, very important. Um, I actually just recently, if I could take one minute to share, um, recently spoke with uh, the police chief and the, I'm on the police chief in Rochester's advisory board um, and mayor and been part of a discussion about, you know, it, because I believe that we need to have discussions. We need to talk about that. You know, how do you police in really dangerous situations and yet not coming from a place of power over, but being willing to spend a little bit of time backing up, having conversations relating to building those relationships, right? And understanding uh, these situations entering into it. But if I took a position of, oh, that's, you know, police bad, <laughs> other people good, that, that's not helpful, right? That's not really a Christian perspective. A Christian social ethics leads me into, I want to engage and hear where they're coming from. What are some of the struggles they're having? What are some of the difficulties and some of the trauma I've heard from police, some of the trauma they've experienced, and then how as we as a community can come together and create a peaceful community, right? But some of the categories that we put people in is not helpful, right? And Christians should be leading in breaking down those categories saying, no, 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 we need to, we need to come together. We need to, the work of God, I think the will of God overall for social, that leads us to a social ethic is 
reconciliation and restoration. It's that God's will always. And as Christians, we need to figure out how to enter into that work in specific, in specifically, you know, how to address it in our day. So I talk way over. I apologize. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions or comments. Do we, or we have to, it's new. Okay. Are there any questions? I don't want to take up more of your time or comments. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Which means you've had discussions about it, right? So that, that's a choice. That's, you know, so that tells me this church is engaged in discussion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. I guess she's... Not the microphone. So, oh, there we go. So, I, as I said, I would just, I feel overwhelmed. I guess May is the best thing. Uh, and this is. All I can do is say thank you, I think, really. But the question that comes to my mind, which is not an easy one, is where do we go from here? And, and that's maybe more to our church, ultimately. But this is not a new topic for you. And I'm curious what you advise churches to do uh, or groups to do in that regard. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think the first step is come together and what what is pressing, you know, and praying together, or having a small group. So for, and it doesn't, like when I talk about violence against women, I always say to people, you know what, if you're addressing economic issues that impact women, you're addressing violence against women. So, so many of these kind of concerns are interrelated. And I feel like whenever there's intervention in one piece of this, you're intervening on the whole. And so it's discerning as a church, hey, you know what, this year, October, for example, is always domestic violence month. Uh, let's talk about that. Let's get, you know, maybe a provider to do something in the hall between service, talk about it, maybe have a speaker, you know, and just get conversation. Not that it's just something let's talk about. Is there something beyond maybe, um, you know, giving an ongoing basis, let's say to a shelter or something, but what's underlying this violence? What, and what, are there some ways in which we engage in um, not treating women and men? And it's hard when we face ourselves, you know, in an equal way. What, where are the, let's listen, let, let's have a listening circle and just men, I've done this, where men are sitting outside the circle and women are just talking about their experience of sexual trauma, and violence and always the reaction of men is, oh my God, that's like you, you all walk in a different world than I do, <laughs> right? Um, and also women listening, I've had it reverse where I've been outside the circle listening to men talk about some of the trauma they've had is growing up as boys and some of those roles. So it's listening is, I know it sounds kind of on the surface, but it's really deep, I think, and helps to lead to other action. Maybe starting also thinking, what are the presenting social concerns that we can have an impact on too? I think immigration is huge right now. I think creation care, environmental concerns. So, but you can't get overwhelmed with every, any, everything because you won't do anything. So it's kind of going there. Maybe saying this year, we're going to, you know, April sexual assault month, you know, so making a year of speakers and going deeper and delving into that or any, any, any topic, but you have to kind of discern as a community, what's pressing for us? What do we feel led to? I never, five years ago, I did not even, I wasn't led into immigration, refugee. And I just really through prayer the last few years, it's been a heavy burden for me to the point where all I kept hearing is get your body to the border, get your body to the border. I think it was the Holy Spirit and I did. And I learned, I was able then to come back and share so much about their experiences. So I, do think, yeah, it's not a burden from God, but just a call. So what do we call to? Um, 
Well, I don't know how much um, background you have about our church, but in 2020, we suffered a trauma with the two pastors and now our two pastors are gone and we're involved in a um, process of healing and reconciliation. And um, you know, the, the team is trying really hard to reach people and trying to find out if we're ready for a uh, pastor, a new pastor nominating committee. And so um, this is a, a very um, thing that's on our minds right now. I mean, at least it's on my mind. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, do you have any suggestions for that? Um, how, I mean, I, I, it's kind of a social ethic thing, I guess. <laughs> Um, but maybe, maybe it's something totally separate, but, um, I, I think that your comment that starting from Christ and not, um, not trying to do it ourselves or something is maybe we need to, I don't know, but anyway, I appreciate your talk and Um, our time is running out. So. Okay, I'll just answer real quick. I, I don't know the background or what you know you're dealing with, but I I was also a clinical counselor. So one suggestion I have is, you know, to have someone facilitate. You know, circles where those listening circles to me are really powerful, um, so people can process and work out and set. You know, it's really here. I don't know what what the issue is, so it's hard for me to address but i think to have a reconciling community the time commitment to pray together is just really key and to listen to each other to not just have a false peace like okay let's move on from here and um that doesn't work because then you never really move on it's always there but can we stay with the pain of whatever happened and listen move through that how do we move through that um, and, and outside facilitator is usually helpful in doing that. Someone who's not attached to. That's good. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I question Oh, wow. Um. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I, I can work on, you know, putting together some resources. The other thing I want to mention, I, I teach a lot of what I just talked about. Um, I teach in a core foundation, it's called Foundations and Christian Social Ethics um, at the seminary, and you can audit it. I think super cheap. I want to say $40, $45. So you're just getting the resources, hearing the lectures, maybe engaging in the forms, but you don't have to do the written work. <laughs> um, you can just, you know, audit that if you're really interested and you go into, it's a 15 week more um, in depth um, there too, but I can get, and then there's specific, like I teach gender reconciliation, you can audit that or specific uh, topics. Next year, for the first time, I'm teaching a course on reading Luther Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King. I uh, used to teach separate courses on them, but now I'm just doing kind of reading and focusing on some of the themes that we, we talked about that's next year. Uh, if I can pull together some resources. Thank you, everybody. Um, Beth, we really do thank you very much for being here today and um, giving us a lot to think about as a community of faith. Uh, so we, we wish you well in your uh, professorship, and uh, we hope to hear you again maybe sometime. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.
have was simply this. Let's, huh? It's on now. Yeah, the word I wanted to have was simply this. Let's do this again. Let's bring thoughtful voices, people reflecting on the faith and its relevance to the world around us and to the well-being of uh, God's church. So I just want to, you know, say to the Christian Ed Committee, let's do this again and, and bring thoughtful voices, um, you know, into our discussion. Um, that's what I wanted to add. And once again, just say thank you uh, for what you brought us today. Thank you so very much. Let us have a moment for prayer. Gracious, eternal, and everlasting God, we continue to say thank you. We say thank you, dear Lord, for how you have blessed our hearts. But dear Lord, we say thank you for how you have blessed our minds today. And we pray, dear Lord, that our heart might meet our mind or our mind might meet our heart and that we can truly become the disciples that you are calling us to be in this present age. We ask dear Lord that you would dismiss us from this place but never from your presence. And we say this prayer and all other prayers in the name of your son, Jesus Christ and the people of God all said together. <laughs>